morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Dr. Ron Reiner. Um, I am the uh, Chief Medical Officer over the Americas Division of Ardent uh, Health Services, but I also have the privilege and pleasure of being uh, the facilitator for the uh, developing CB service line of the Ardent Enterprise. And it's really under both mantras that, uh, that we uh, are assembling today to discuss the high sensitivity troponin that will be eventually uh, utilized throughout the enterprise. You should look at today's activities as the first of a lot of different educational sessions. Uh, and some of you, and Adam will highlight who those are and who aren't, uh, have already started down this pathway. But uh, um, as I say, this, uh, this ain't the way it used to be. So you got to learn how it's going to be as well as how it is for those of you who, uh, who do use uh, high sensitivity troponins already. So I have the pleasure, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam Maddox in just a moment, but we also have a guest speaker, Dr. Stephen Ness, who's Director of Medical and Scientific Affairs, uh, and he'll introduce himself in a little bit uh, at, at, the, at one of the organizations who, who provides these types of assays. So Adam, let me uh, turn it over to you but maybe before I do that, let me remind everybody that we have a diverse audience on this call. There are people from pathology, nurse managers, directors from the emergency department, uh, medical officers from different areas, including the emergency room and, uh, and uh, hospitalists. Virtually, uh, the invite went out to people who touch high sensitivity troponin results and need to be in a position of being able to interpret them. So with that having been said, Adam, now it's all yours. And we'll talk from there. Thank you, Dr. Reiner. Um, so just to kind of highlight where we are in the enterprise, um, we've got four main chemistry vendors, uh, Siemens, Beckman Coulter, Roche, and Abbott. Um, Siemens recently has pulled off contemporary troponin from their, their assay menu. They're using high sensitivity. Um, right now, University of Kansas St. Francis is using that assay, the high sensitivity, and Passac Valley is as well. So um, what I would say is, is connecting with your laboratory, your laboratory will be sending things out about this, this conversion transition. Um, but if you have any questions, your laboratory director would probably have the best um, real time where we are. Many have already validated this assay. Many are working on implementing it. This is really just a, a great training um, exercise to educate everybody about what high sensitivity troponin is. So with that being said, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ness. Perfect, uh, thank you, Dr. Reiner, and uh, thank you, Adam. I appreciate the invitation to uh, be able to uh, present this information. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give a, a broad overview of the clinical utility of high sensitivity troponin speaking generically <clears throat> to all the, the manufacturers that have FDA approval of high sensitivity troponin. And when I speak specifically to the Beckman assay, I'll, I'll mention uh, that it's specific to the Beckman assay. So as, uh, as disclosure, I'm a full-time employee of Beckman Coulter. I'm a director of medical and scientific affairs. I am not on the sales side of the organization. I have uh, no reporting responsibility. Uh, at all on the sales side, I'm strictly on the medical and scientific affairs. And prior to joining Beckman, I practiced for a number of years as a, a physician in the Navy. I was a Navy physician for the Marines. So the way military medicine works, the Marine Corps gets all their medical support from the Navy. I had fi uh, five Navy docs under me and collectively we uh, took care of well over 3,000 active duty Marines. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so as a starting point, uh, let's uh, first get grounded in, in definition. So in the literature, CTN is the abbreviation for cardiac troponin. And the generation of troponins that are being used today uh, are either referred to as contemporary or conventional troponin. And then the newest generation of troponins are your high sensitivity troponins, HSTNI for high sensitivity troponin I, and HSTNT, high sensitivity troponin T. So for example, Beckman, has uh, in the market FDA approved high sensitivity troponin I, and Roche, for example, has in the market FDA approval for high sensitivity troponin T. Uh, next slide. So, 
So the use uh, of troponins, both contemporary and high sensitivity troponin, uh, typically starts with uh, the chest pain patient presenting to the ED, where uh, they're initially in the category of acute coronary syndrome or ACS. And within ACS, there's two broad categories. So there's your myocardial injury on the right in purple, such as uh, your heart failure, myocarditis, uh, arrhythmias, and then there's your ischemic events on the left in red, uh, your myocardial infarctions. So both type 1 and type 2 MI. Identical to the current contemporary troponin we're using today, the new high sensitivity troponin, you will get abnormal high sensitivity troponin with both myocardial injury, such as what you see on the right in purple, and you'll get elevated abnormal high sensitivity troponin for ischemia and necrosis on the left. So that's identical to the current contemporary troponins today, and also identical to the current contemporary troponins today. High sensitivity troponins will not differentiate type 1 from type 2 MIs. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to be presenting three case studies where you're going to be asked to log into a, a separate website and uh, put in what your, your working diagnosis is for the case study. And just to give you, just to sort of give you a, a, a teaser, not every elevated troponin is ischemia. So you will see elevated troponin for myocardial injury, and it's all about the delta, the change from one troponin to the next, and that, that's the real crux of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, next slide. So let's start now with what stays the same. So what stays the same, meaning going from the current contemporary troponin to the new high sensitivity troponin. So, first off, we're measuring the same troponin molecule. It's just due to enhancements in the assay itself that the newer high sensitivity troponins are much more sensitive, meaning we can now get much lower reportable numbers. The second thing that stays the same is a high end critical value. So, if you look at the chart on the top right, the higher that troponin level is, the higher the positive predictive value for ischemia. So, if the institution you're at today, if they're currently using a high-end critical value for troponin to rule in ischemia, that will stay the same. Now, we can't confuse cutoff from high-end critical value. So, those are two separate things, and I'll get to that shortly. But again, if you're using a high-end critical value, that, that's, all, that's going to stay the same. Third thing that stays the same is the patterns that you'll see on serial measurement. So, with myocardial injury, let's say uh, uh, tachycardia, let's say uh, heart failure, you will get abnormal troponins, but on serial measurement, the high sensitivity troponins will be at a consistently elevated abnormal level. Whereas with ischemia on serial measurements, you'll see a sharp rise or fall pattern. And the assay takes advantage of that sharp rise and fall pattern by looking at the delta or the change from your baseline troponin to your uh, your next troponin. Next. So a very simple graphic, but it's useful in just starting to explain this difference between cutoffs and deltas. So what we're looking at is simply going from left to right, your normal healthy reference population, and in the field of troponins and high sensitivity troponins, your normal healthy reference population is defined as uh, no history of cardiac disease, normal blood pressure, on no cardiac meds, then you cross what's called the 99th percentile. 99th percentile is uh, simply a fancy way of saying your normal range. So as soon as you cross that 99th percentile, there's something going on with the heart, but we don't know if it's myocardial injury or ischemia. Right now, the next definition in the uh, shaded yellow box, right now with contemporary troponin, you're making clinical, clinical decisions based on that contemporary troponin crossing an established cutoff. So you can see that cutoff is above the high sensitivity troponin's 99th percentile because high sensitivity troponins can report out much lower numbers. So this is the first time you're going to hear me point out the difference in cutoffs from deltas. So right now, uh, your, your draw protocol for contemporary may be baseline three, six, nine hours, meaning 
in some cases, you have to wait up to nine hours to see if that chest pain patient's contemporary troponin is going to cross that cutoff. Those days go away with high sensitivity troponin, and we're, we're getting into the Delta discussion shortly. And then I mentioned in a previous slide or two, high end critical value. So if you look at the solid red line, that depicts the trajectory of a troponin value in a patient with uh, acute myocardial infarction. So the value will start out in the normal healthy reference population, and then it gets to a point where you'll see this uh, steep rise, and that rise is due to that section of the cardiac, that section of the heart muscle that's dying. It's releasing troponin, releasing troponin. Then it gets to the point where that section is completely, uh, completely dead. So there's no more troponin to be released. And then you get the downside of the ski slope in that patient with MI. So if you're using a high end critical value, that will stay the same. What we're adding now is this delta to be able to, basically, for lack of a better word, to be able to see if this traje trajectory is going to be for acute MI or if the trajectory is going to stay flat and be more for myocardial injury. A printer is, is working, so please mute your mi uh, microphone if you're not talking. Thank you. So now let's transition into what is different. Uh, the first two things that are different is unit change and separate male and female 99th percentiles. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna start with the unit change. And the reason I'm starting with the unit change is anecdotally, I've assisted 80, 90 hospitals in making this transition from contemporary to high sensitivity troponin. Dr. Reiner and Adam are doing a fantastic job here in really putting together a robust educational campaign. Where that doesn't happen, the most common stumbling block is this unit change because the ED docs and cardiologists we're not given a heads up of the change. So this unit change, it's guidelines from the IFCC, International Federation of Clinical Chemistry, and we're moving from nanograms per milliliter to picograms per milliliter. And the reason for the unit change is threefold. Uh, number one, it's, uh, it's due to getting us to a point where there's standardization. So one hospital is talking the same language to the second, to another hospital, uh, the second reason is we can now read much lower levels of troponin down into the picogram range. And then the third reason is since we are now making clinical interpretations based on a delta or a change, it's much, it's much easier to visually see a change in whole numbers than in decimal points. So the conversion factor is simply multiplying by a thousand old units and that puts you in the new units. Uh, practically speaking, most hospitals, a lot of hospitals are reporting out in picograms per milliliter. However, in the cardiac literature, you're going to see nanograms per liter. The unit change is still the same. So nanograms per milliliter multiplied by a thousand, that puts you in the new units. So I'll give you a specific example of where, the, where this was a stumbling block. At a, a particular hospital I worked with, a cardiologist was accustomed to seeing a 0.03 and not getting too excited about a 0.03. Now he saw a 30, but this 30 was really a fairly equivalent to, to a 0.03. It's simply due, due to this unit change. So first difference is a unit change. Uh, next slide. And the second difference is since we can now uh, report out values very deep or very low in the normal healthy reference population, we are now able to establish separate male and female 99th percentiles or separate male and female normal ranges. So the chart on the bottom, uh, these are Beckman numbers, uh, and just because I, I know the Beckman numbers, all of us that have FDA approval on a high sensitivity troponin, so Beckman Coulter, Abbott, Roche, Siemens, all of us have FDA approval on two things. Number one, the intended use, and the intended use being high sensitivity troponin as an aid in identifying ischemia. And we also all have FDA approval on an overall normal range, and that buckets both males and females together. We have FDA approval on a female specific normal range, and in Beckman's case, 14. 
and we have FDA approval in a male specific normal range and in Beckman, Beckman's case 20. So why the difference in male and female normal range? It simply has to do with anatomically, the female heart is smaller. So smaller, meaning less uh, cardiac muscle mass, less cardiac muscle mass, meaning less troponin to be released into the bloodstream. So the chart on the top depicts the clinical advantage we now have with establishing separate male and female normal ranges. If out of the gate, if you went with an overall normal range, and in Bexman's case, 18, and that's depicted by the gray bar, what you would get is a few number of false positives with males because the male normal range is actually a little higher than the overall normal range. And then the opposite is true for females. On females, if you went with may not be completely proficient, but they yeah. can get their cards, they can have the knowledge in their head, they just need the experience. Please, uh, please and mute your microphones, folks, if you're not speaking directly to the program. Thank you. And if you went with a female specific normal range, there's a slightly higher clinical advantage because you're decreasing a few more false negatives for females than decreasing the false positives for males. So, bottom line, out of the gate, you have the opportunity to either go with an overall FDA approved overall normal range or sex specific. The other point that I need to make is the heavy lift in uh, high sensitivity troponin is establishing your high sensitivity troponin protocol. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When you do that, the normal ranges are assay specific. So a Beckman normal range is different from a Siemens, which is different from a Roche and so on. And uh, we're very quickly getting into the Delta discussion. The deltas are also assay specific. So, so you have to keep that in mind that these normal ranges and deltas are manufacturer or assay specific. Next. Okay, so now let's get into the deltas. So the, the other thing that's different is instead of waiting for troponin to cross your current contemporary cutoff, we are now looking at a delta or a change from your baseline troponin to your next. And at the end of the day, what does this do for us? It decreases the amount of time in our draw protocol. And by doing that, at the end of the day, the one thing high sensitivity troponin does for us, faster rule ins, so that chest pain patient is getting to the cardiologist faster and faster rule outs because we can now get uh, numbers so low that the sensitivity for uh, sensitivity approaches 100%, meaning these very low numbers were not missing ischemia. So if we look at the, the chart, it's or the graphic, it's similar to the one I had up earlier, left to right, normal healthy reference population. Then we cross the 99th percentile, there's something going on with the heart. What you're doing today, you're what in a, a typical contemporary draw protocol that I see is baseline, three, six, nine, and in some cases, I'm seeing it go all the way out to 12 hours to give troponin enough time to see if it's going to cross your current contemporary cutoff. Let's take the chest pain patient, for example, who is having an MI as depicted with a solid red line. What we're doing today is not only waiting to see if troponin crosses an established cutoff, but also looking to see if it reaches a high end critical value. Now, by looking at the delta, and the delta in this case is depicted by the two X's. So the first X on the left would be your baseline high sensitivity troponin uh, when, the, when the patient's admitted to the ED. And then your next X would be your second high sensitivity troponin that you can do as quickly as one or two hours after your first. That delta, if it's clinically significant or big enough, it's essentially giving you a sneak peek into predicting if the trajectory is going to be a ski slope for ischemia or if it's going to be abnormal and flat for myocardial injury. So we no longer have to wait for a high end critical value. This delta now is, is basically giving us a sneak peek to see if that trajectory is going to be a steep rise and fall pattern for ischemia or if it's going to be a flat pattern for myocardial injury, let's say for example, a heart failure. Next please. So now I'm gonna transition into, uh, into the literature. Uh, high sensitivity troponin uh, is the uh, biomarker of choice per the fourth universal definition of MI. 
So I'm, I'm going to date myself. So we've gone from, and I know change is never easy, but all of you have gone, or most of you have gone through the days of myoglobin. Then we went to CKMB. Then we went to contemporary troponin. Now we're taking that next leap in the high sensitivity troponin. Next. And most recently, uh, high sensitivity troponin uh, is the biomarker of choice as stated in the new chest pain guidelines that were just published in the uh, physician journal circulation uh, uh, four to six weeks ago. Next. In fact, the guidelines, one of the top 10 take home messages in the new guidelines, take home message number two is high sensitivity troponins are preferred. High sensitivity cardiac troponins are the preferred standard for establishing a biomarker diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, allowing for more accurate detection and exclusion of myocardial injury. Next. AF, so th 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 this particular publication, it's not data he heavy, it's content heavy, and why to make that transition to high sensitivity troponin. So it's an expert panel recommendation on why and how to make that transition. And two of the more widely published cardiologists in the field of high sensitivity troponin, uh, Dr. Januzzi, cardiologist out of Mass General, and Dr. Jaffe, uh, cardiologist out of the Mayo Clinic. Next. And in their recommendation, they specifically state the collaborative educational process should take at least several weeks to, to months. So I, I would, of the hospitals I've assisted, from day one where you're thinking about making the transition to your go live date, I'd be in the ballpark if I said it's about a eight to 10 week process. And the reason for that uh, unit change, uh, it's now deltas instead of a cutoff. We're now uh, getting whole numbers and not decimal points. The protocols are different. Uh, and it not only involves the lab, involves ED docs and nurses, hospitalists, cardiologists, there's just a lot of stakeholders and the educational process uh, typically uh, takes a, a, a good amount of time, but it's the heavy lift is the development of the protocol. And I'll give you an example of what a protocol looks like of a very large IDN that just went live with the assay a few weeks ago. Next, please. So I mentioned earlier that all the manufacturers that have FDA approval for a high sensitivity troponin, we have FDA approval on the intended use, that it's an aid in identifying ischemia, and we have all of us have FDA approval on an overall normal range and sex specific normal range. What none of us have FDA approval on is what is a clinically significant delta, meaning what is a change in your troponin that's indicative of ischemia, meaning the delta is big enough to be indicative of ischemia and not myocardial injury. So where do we get those deltas? We have to fall back on what's in the peer reviewed published literature and you have to read the published studies that are using the method or manufacturer that's in your lab. So I mentioned earlier that a Beckman delta is different than a Siemens delta, which is different than a Roche delta. So this is uh, one of uh, several studies that publishes on a clinically significant one hour delta for, uh, for the Beckman assay. Next. And two different cohorts. Uh, so cohort in the top 686 chest pain patients, cohort in the bottom 680. All these published studies exclude ST elevation MIs. So these are only uh, non-STEMIs. And the reason for that is identical to your current protocol today. ST elevation MIs immediately go into their separate pathway. And so the same is true with uh, high sensitivity troponins. So this particular study uh, published on a, and let's look at the top cohort, just so we're all looking at the, the same cohort. This uh, particular study published on a rollout. So I'm looking at the green box on the left a rule out of an initial high sensitivity troponin of less than four if chest pain is documented for greater than three hours. So a, a common question that I get is, is it continuous chest pain or is it onset of chest pain? And it's onset of chest pain. Now, irrespective of time of onset of chest pain, it's also published on a rule out of baseline high sensitivity troponin of less than five 
and a one hour delta of less than four. So to put this in perspective, these are very low numbers, giving you a negative predictive value for ischemia of 100%, meaning we're not missing an ischemia. And just to sort of give you an idea of what these, how low these numbers are, a less than five is fairly equivalent to a 0 0.005 on the current assay. None of the contemporary troponins in the market can get anywhere close to reporting out a 0 0.005. In fact, the current contemporary assays, typically anything below the cutoff, and a common cutoff that I'm seeing is 0.03, the lab report, the report back to the uh, physician, will simply say less than 0.03, meaning anything below your current cutoff, it's not a reportable, actionable number. That's why in the current contemporary protocols, you have to wait three, six, nine, in some cases up to 12 hours to give troponin enough time to see if it's going to cross that cutoff. So again, back to uh, this study, a uh, rule out is published on less than four if chest pain's documented for great, greater than three hours or less than five and, or in addition to a one hour delta of less than four. Now let's jump over to the rule inside in red. On any given draw, if you get a value greater than or equal to 50, and that would be considered a critical value that's published as a rule in or any time or if you get a one hour delta of greater than or equal to 15 that's published as a rule in for ischemia so in this study at the one hour mark based on the troponin value we are able to triage either on the rule inside 15 percent or the rule outside 55%. So at the one hour mark, and this is the crux here of high sensitivity troponin. At the one hour mark, 15% of the chest pain patients were sent to the cardiologist. 55% were ruled out. So we were able to give a designation to 70% of the chest pain patients as quickly as one hour, which leaves us then in the middle in the yellow zone, the 30% who then re, uh, have to go further down the protocol that I'm going to share with you, and they then require a third troponin draw to establish a second delta. So again, at the end of the day, clinically, it's faster rule ins, faster rule outs. So again, you can see at the one hour mark, 70% of the chest pain patients were given a rule in or rule out designation. Uh, next, next, please. <clears throat> now, 30 day MACE in this study, 30-day uh, MACE on the rule outside, 1.4%, on the rule inside, 74%, and in the middle indeterminate or observed zone where we have to get a third high-sensitivity troponin to get a second delta, 20%. Another important point, identical to the current contemporary troponin, not every elevated or clinically significant delta on high-sensitivity troponin will ultimately be ischemia. So we're, we're never using just troponin to make a rule in decision. Troponin is just one piece. So troponin is organ specific, not disease specific. So in this study, if it wasn't ischemia, what was it? And most commonly it was cardiomyopathy, myocarditis and unstable angina. Next. Now, one of the top three questions I get from cardiologists is uh, they'll say, Steve, why do I even need to know these low numbers, the low numbers down below the 99th percentile or down below the normal range? And so th this same study uh, illustrates or points out why these low numbers are important. So what this is, is the y-axis is the initial high sensitivity troponin value the initial value on that chest pain patient presenting to the ED, and the x-axis is the final adjudicated diagnosis. So going from left to right, acute MI, unstable angina, the third category, cardiac, uh, heart failure, for example, fourth category, non-cardiac, uh, sepsis, for example, and then the fifth bucket, unknown. The solid red line is the 99th percentile, or an, anything below that is your normal range, and this particular chart is called a box and whisker chart. So the blue box is your median 50% high sensitivity troponin values upon presentation to the ED. Top whisker is your highest 25% values or highest quartile. 
and your bottom whisker is your lowest quartile, lowest values upon presentation to the ED. So again, back to that question I typically get from cardiologists, why do I need to know numbers very low in the normal range? It's because of this. So number one, these very low numbers are most useful for the ED doc, that if we get numbers so low, the negative predictive value for ischemia approaches 100%, it assists ED docs in making faster rule out decisions. But also, even though that initial high sensitivity troponin is normal, we're still not out of the woods. Now we can get reportable, actionable numbers very deep or low in the normal range, and that gives the ED doc an immediate starting point to start measuring a delta. So you can see in this published study, as circled in, uh, in red, about 20% of those chest pain patients who went on to have a final adjudicated diagnosis of acute MI, about 20%, their initial high sensitivity troponin value was below the normal range. And again, a reminder, these are numbers we can't get with current contemporary troponins. So that gives us a jump start to, for troponin to start indicating ischemia for us. So that initial very low value, it's an immediate starting point for the physician then to start measuring a delta as quickly as one hour later. Next. And let me go, to, if I were to round out the top three questions I get from cardiologists, an, an, the other common question I get is, are my consults going to go up? Probably not on the day. Well, so I'm gonna speak anecdotally. Uh, Yes, the day of visit, the first few weeks when you roll out high sensitivity troponin, because in my experience, a lot of hospitals, until they get to a very good comfort level with high sensitivity troponins, hospitals may be overcalling ischemia initially. After the first few weeks where there's a, a better comfort level with the new protocol with high sensitivity troponin, from a cardiology standpoint, you probably will see more consults, but on an outpatient basis. And the reason for that, there's new numbers we're getting that we haven't been able to get with the current contemporary assay, and that's depicted in this graphic. So normal healthy reference population left to right, then you cross the, the high sensitivity troponin 99th percentile, and we get into something going on with the heart. The new numbers that you're now getting are numbers below your old contemporary cutoff, and it's depicted by this uh, double-headed green arrow. So the new numbers that we are now getting are numbers below the current contemporary cutoff, but above the 99th percentile. And what lives in there is most likely myocardial injury. Next slide. And that was actually observed and reported on in JAMA back August 2019. Due to the greater sensitivity of proponent assays, we're getting new numbers, new lower numbers, and uh, one in eight patients presenting to the hospital will have evidence of myocardial injury, uh, carries a concerning prognosis, five-year mortality rate, 70%, and MACE of 30%. So again, it's we are getting new numbers, and these new numbers enable us to identify most likely myocardial injury pathology earlier than what we can do with the current contemporary assay. Next. So to give you an example, so this, this is not the case study. This is to give you an example of how useful these new lower numbers are. So this is a hospital that ran high sensitivity troponin in parallel to, the, to, their, to their contemporary or old troponin assay, but they were not making clinical decisions on the high sensitivity troponin assay. So looking at the, the chart on the top right, uh, baseline troponin, that's upon presentation to the ED, and where it says current assay nanograms per milliliter, that's the current contemporary assay. And then on the far right, high sensitivity troponin, that is the high sensitivity troponin assay that was run in parallel, but physicians, the ED docs and cardiologists were blinded to those results and no, no clinical action was being taken. But what you can see, so this is a, 42 email presents the ED, nausea, vomiting, trouble breathing. Initial EKG was normal. Uh, second EKG, and I do not know the timing of when the second EKG 
uh, noted ST elevation and final diagnosis acute MI STEMI. But the take home point though is uh, looking uh, now down at the bottom, Beckman's overall normal range for both males and females is 18. Beckman has a female specific normal range of 14. So let's keep that in mind, female specific normal range of 14. Now let's jump up to the top uh, graph. The initial baseline when this patient presented to the ED was right at the top of the normal range for females of 14. That's with the high sensitivity troponin assay. However, with the older contemporary assay, the number was too low to be reported out. It was still below the cutoff of 0.03. So the report back to the physician simply said less than 0.03. That's not an actionable number. But you can see if we were making clinical decisions on the high sensitivity troponin assay, the ED would have been alerted, oh, this initial high sensitivity troponin value is right at the high end of the normal range for females. Then three hours later, the current contemporary assay still reported out a less than 0.03. So that level still wasn't high enough for the contemporary assay to report out a number, but with the high sensitivity troponin, it jumped up to 36. And so that delta turned out to be clinically significant for ischemia. And as you can see, the third and fourth draws were very high, but with that delta that we got from baseline to the third, from 14 to 36, we already had a sneak peek just based on high sensitivity troponin alone that, tra that the uh, trajectory was going to be that ski slope indicative of ischemia. All right, so let's, I believe I have one more before we transition into the case studies. Okay, so this is an example of a, a protocol that is being used today in uh, uh, the St. Luke's Health System IDN in uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So let me walk you through it. So ACS, then if you can see on the, on the right, the ST elevation MIs, they go in their own pathway, their own flow chart. So these are all chest pain, non-ST elevation. So we have our baseline high sensitivity troponin I zero hour. That's your, that's your baseline. That's the initial high sensitivity troponin. Anything less than five starts to put you on rapid rule out. So I'm now looking at the, the left side and there should be an arrow uh, going from less than five nanograms per milliliter straight down to delta less than five. So just imagine there's, there's an arrow there. Yes. If your initial high sensitivity troponin is less than four and chest pain is documented greater than three hours, then we're over on the, the far right and we immediately then go down to the heart score and the heart, sc and the heart score determines what type of follow-up we get with discharge. Irrespective of time of onset of chest pain, if the initial high sensitivity troponin is less than five and the two hour delta, so St. Luke's decided to go with a two hour protocol, not a one hour. If the initial high sensitivity troponin is less than five and the delta at two hours is less than five, that also then puts us on rapid rule out and the uh, outpatient follow up is based then on the heart score. Now let's jump over to the far right, rapid rule in. Any measurement at any given point greater than or equal to 50 is a rule in. And then let's look at the yellow zone. So we don't have a, a greater than 50 and we don't have a less than five. That puts us in the observe or in the terminate. So that's the yellow five to 49. And then at this point, it's all about the deltas. So any value five to 49, uh, we're, we're then measuring our first delta at two hours. If the delta is greater than or equal to 20, that push, pushes us over to the rule in. If we still do not have a clinically significant delta for ischemia at two hours, then St. Luke's went with uh, consult medical service, and then they're looking at that four hour delta. That, that, then they're drawing a third high sensitivity troponin at the four hour mark to establish a second delta. So a couple key things here, 
it's all it's all about the deltas to roll in and on the rapid roll out side it's now the the fact that we have the ability to get these very low numbers we couldn't get before where the negative predictive value for ischemia is 100% and all the protocols i've worked with they they all most incorporate the heart clinical risk score and the delta is always always goes back to the your baseline high sensitivity troponin so it so you you look at the delta Let's say, for example, you have to do three high sensitivity troponin draws. So your first baseline, let's call it a 10. Your second high sensitivity troponin at two hours, let's call it a uh, 15. And then your third high sensitivity troponin at the four hour mark, let's call it a 30. That 30, the delta always goes back to the initial high sensitivity troponin. And in, in the example I just gave, the initial high sensitivity troponin was a 10, so your delta would be 20. So we're going to use these numbers in the protocol for the case studies, and I'm going to remind you what the clinically significant delta is for each case study. So in this protocol, and this protocol is based on the uh, peer-reviewed publication that I showed in my presentation. So. This protocol uses a high end critical value of greater than or equal to 50. So anytime you get that, that points you towards just based on the troponin portion of your clinical assessment alone, anything greater than or equal to 50 points you towards a rule in for ischemia or a delta of greater than or equal to 20 points you towards uh, ischemia. So I'm going to remind you of in these case studies that a high end critical value is greater than or equal to 50 and a clinically significant delta for ischemia is anything greater than or equal to 20. So let me, uh, Dr. Reiner, would you like me to pause here and take questions or do it after the, uh, the three case studies? Well, let's, um, um, let's, let's if, if there's a burning question that someone has, I, I'm sure there are questions. I have a quick one. This is Mel Peralta in, Albu in Albuquerque. Um, so, so the clinical scenario, when we talk about the Delta, like you guys said, that's the thing that hasn't had the FDA approval. I think partly is that because I think we can be confusing for this is it's always linked to clinical syndrome. If you're doing a heart risk score on someone of the ERs because they're coming with a chest pain syndrome that could be consistent with unstable angina, right? So a Delta that can be quite helpful because they have a clinical syndrome linked to that, but you can also have someone that comes in with, you know, troponin are used. We draw them on everybody now, right? Not just people that are coming in with ACS rule outs. You know, these people are complex. So someone comes with sepsis, they can have a Delta 50. That doesn't mean that they're, when you say that, oh, it's, it's highly specific. If you don't have a Delta, then they, yeah, then they don't have an acquitted vessel coming with a chest pain syndrome. But correct me if I'm wrong, but if someone comes in, they're profoundly hypotensive, just like we see now, we can see troponins that go up really high and non-acute occluded ACS with a type 2 non-STEMI pattern or clinical situation, but you have to link it always to the clinical scenario. It's not just, oh, they have a delta, they must have an occluded CERC. We now uh, they have a septic patient. So I think that's where probably is part of the learning, I guess, with institutions, or am I wrong? No, you, you're, you're spot on correct. And identical to the current contemporary troponin, not every contemporary troponin that crosses your cutoff or not every... Con uh, contemporary troponin value above your critical value is going to be ischemia. So, so then the example you gave of sepsis is a perfect example. Absolutely, you could get a delta for ischemia, but it's not ischemia. And so it goes back to a comment I made earlier is high sensitivity troponin, it's uh, organ specific and not cardiac necrosis specific. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm, I'm here. I got a troponin console in the ER. I got to go see. So, <laughs> uh, this has been really helpful. I appreciate. I appreciate. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I know we probably have a significant number of questions. I just highlight again. This is the first of several educational sessions, and, and we we are going to have to end in a few minutes. But I'd like. Uh, Dr. Ness to run through with Adam's help uh, a couple of the case studies, just a tweak interest here so that people understand the complexity of it. So 
Uh, Adam, you want to, or, or uh, Steve, you want to put your first case study up and then Adam can do his thing with the Mentimeter and we'll have people vote. We're going to vote here on this. So, so pay attention to the case study, folks. No harm, no foul. Nobody's getting any grades, by the way, but just go ahead. <laughs> so real quick, guys, before Dr. Ness um, presents the case studies, if you can go to an internet browser and type in menti.com, um, you will be able to pull up a website and um, what the, the case is, we're going to use this code here, 10236237. So when you pull up menti.com, enter this code in, and, um, and that's how we're going to use some of the case study material and um, make our, our uh, diagnoses. I've got another slide that I'll pull this back up in a minute, so if you didn't get that information. Uh, could could you put the code again? Because they want the code number again. If you're yep. one one two three one zero two three six two three seven. One zero two three two three six two three seven. Thank you. You know. All right. There we go. Okay. So case study number one and and. I, I do have to admit, I oversimplified these case studies, and I did that intentionally because I just want to highlight the EKG and specifically the high sensitivity troponin portion of these, these studies. So, 75 year old white male presents the ED with chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, states uh, shortness of breath started yesterday, woke him up in the morning, uh, chest pains 2 out of 10 uh, in intensity. He has three days post-op for laparoscopic uh, coli, history of hypertension, uh, vitals are, as you see, uh, significantly heart rate 125. On exam, uh, heart rate 125, irregular rhythm, otherwise normal findings, and EKG, as you can see. The troponins, let me walk you through the troponins, and let's use 18 as a normal range. Let's say we went with an overall normal range of 18. Initial high sensitivity troponin was 29. And if you recall from the presentation, identical to the current contemporary troponin, not every elevated troponin will be ischemia. You will get elevated troponin with both myocardial injury and myocardial infarction. So initial baseline troponin, 29. At the two hour mark, uh, Troponin uh, went up to 37, and then at the four hour mark, troponin went up to 39. The delta always goes back to your baseline troponin. So in this case, we look at our last high sensitivity troponin at four hours of 39, back to the baseline of 29. So we have a delta of 10. Let's, for argument's sake, let's say we're using the St. Luke's protocol, a clinically significant delta for ischemia is 20. So anything greater than or equal to 20 makes us lean towards ischemia. Okay. So again, the codes here at the top. And if you need to look at the case study one last time before we do the diagnoses. And then just uh, again, the troponins are above the normal range and the delta is 10, a clinically significant delta for ischemia uh, if we're using the St. Luke's protocol is 20. So it looks like the majority choosing myocardial injury, Dr. Ness. We'll get back to the presentation and go through the explanation. So uh, each of the high sensitivity troponins were above the normal range you will get uh, abnormal high sensitivity troponins with both injury and ischemia. Uh, diagnosis AFib with rapid ventricular response. So we never reached a high end critical value of 50 and our delta never got greater than or equal to 20. So just based on the troponin portion of your assessment that leaned us more towards injury and uh, not ischemia and necrosis. Good. 
right. Uh, number two, 59, 59-year-old black male, history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, presents ED, complaining of chest pain. Uh, state's pain started suddenly while he was seated at home several hours prior to presentation. Describes the pain as throbbing, 7 out of 10, substernal, associated with nausea, diaphoresis, and dyspnea. Uh, vitals are, as you see, on exam, well-appearing, no acute distress, heart uh, regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, gallops, lungs clear, abdomen normal, extremities warm, no edema, no edema. high sensitivity troponin, uh, normal range, again, let's, we're going to go with an overall normal range of 18. Initial high sensitivity troponin 19. Two hours later, we got our second high sensitivity troponin of 46. Gives us a delta of 27. And I believe we have an EKG on. So the delta. Yeah, so go ahead, Adam. So a delta of 27 is above our a delta of 20. And this is the EKG. look at your, your browser, you should be able to see that EKG on your slide, and you can vote. Look, we've got 11 that have voted, so Dr. Ness, if you want to explain the case, we've got, just to show the responses one more time, so everybody can see. So ED disposition, uh, non-STEMI, and I I use this, this one specifically to show that with at least with just the troponin portion of your assessment, it enables us to do things a little faster. So in this case, at the two hour mark, based on the delta alone, uh, we had an indication that it's most likely ischemia. So it, we, and we no longer, we didn't have to wait to see if it's going to cross that critical value of 50. So again, this delta just gives us a, a snapshot or a sneak peek to see if it's moving in the direction of, of ischemia. So that's why I used uh, this one as an example. And last one, Adam. All right, so number three, 29-year-old white male, ALL, treated with full body radiation, marrow transplant, and chemo 12 years ago, uh, presents the ED, acute chest pain, shortness of breath, that began an hour upon arrival. Uh, prior to the ED, walked in the local CVS, check his blood pressure, which was 150s over 90s. Although unable to describe the quality of the pain, he is writhing in pain on the stretcher and rates it a 10 out of 10. Nothing seems to be giving him relief. He denies any similar past episodes. Patient is not currently on any meds, denies history of smoking or illicit drug use. Uh, patient's father has a history of coronary artery disease in his 50s. Mother's health is unremarkable. Patient has been in complete remission from ALL for, uh, for 12 years. He has no other medical conditions. BP 140 over 90, otherwise vitals normal. Uh, physical exam, heart uh, regular rate and rhythm without murmurs, rubs, gallops. Lungs clear, abdomen normal. Extremities warm, no edema. Uh, labs, potassium 4.3. And troponin's baseline 10, so our normal range is 18. His initial high sensitivity troponin was in the normal range of 10. Two hours, we get our second high sensitivity troponin. It's 36. That gives us a delta of 26. And we'll, we'll use an EKG, as you can see, and we'll use the St. Luke's protocol, a clinically significant delta uh, is greater than or equal to 20. So his initial high sensitivity troponin in the normal range, delta at two hour mark, 26. If you go to the Mentimeter, you can see that same slide. 
and put your response in. History of AOL in full remission. All right, it looks like we've got six responses in. Nine. Majority going with myocardial ischemia. Dr. Ness, I'll turn it back over to you. So I used this one as an example where your baseline high sensitivity, so uh, ED disposition, uh, non-STEMI. And I used this one specifically as an example, your initial high sensitivity troponin was in the normal range. That doesn't mean you're out of the woods. These are numbers now we can get for the first time. And as you recall from one of the studies I presented, 20% of the chest pain patients in that study who had a final diagnosis of MI, their initial high sensitivity troponin was in the normal range. So it was this delta of 26, and, and given the history of AOL, uh, underwent uh, numerous rounds of chemo, uh, even though given his age 26, uh, put this patient at risk for a, a future MI, and it was the delta that, just based on the troponin portion, leaned us uh, in that direction. So again, the common theme you've heard throughout, we're not identifying new MIs, we're just getting those patients to the cardiologist faster, and we're getting them on a rule outside, we're getting them out of the ED faster. All right, so that's all I got. Let me turn it over to you, Dr. Reiner. All right, well, thank you very, very much, Steve. Excellent job, and uh, for sake of time, I think we're at the uh, the magic hour here. Obviously, uh, hopefully all of you uh, can appreciate the nuance of how do you uh, have to look at this carefully to learn how to interpret it appropriately. Some of you are at this point in time more conversant than others with how to do it. Uh, by the time it rolls out at everywhere across the enterprise, we hope we'll all be experts at it. And so I'm indebted to, to Adam and to Dr. Ness for their kind uh, um, showing of these uh, nuances today. You will see these gentlemen again.